All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to love this episode. It's all about how to get horny. This is a great episode on libido. And we're going to give away a MAPS anabolic program. It, it's probably our best program to, for libido boost. It's a great strength training program. Here's how you can win access to MAPS anabolic. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this video. Make it a good comment. And if we pick your comment, you'll get access to MAPS anabolic. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications so that you know when we post these videos, and we do them almost daily. And you got to get in there in the first 24 hours. Also, one more thing, huge sale going on still right now. Maps Anabolic is 50% off, and the Shredded Summer Bundle is 50% off. You can find both of them at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code April Special. All right, enjoy the podcast. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's. Uh, that's a good idea. This uh, this episode we're talking about um, how to improve your libido. You know, libido is one of the. It's a it's a key thing to look at when you're looking at your health. You know that when the libido drops considerably, it's actually a pretty good sign that something is off. Now that something could be physical. It could be hormonal. It could be mental. Is that why? Is it because it's connected to so many other things? Is that why? I mean, why is it? Why is it that um, you know there's there's multiple factors that could really be affecting your libido? Well, I mean, if we use the evolution argument, right? right. It's that that you're when you're procreating, right? That's what sex is ultimately is procreating, or at least the possibility that your body and mind really wants that to wants that to happen so long as the environment is safe for you and your off potential offspring. So if you're, for example, under a lot of stress, evolutionary in evolution terms, that could mean that there's not enough food or that there's a lot of predators, in which case your body's like, uh-uh, having a baby could put you in at a lot of risk mm -hmm. um, or just even taking the time to have sex, for example. So is there something that happens? I, let's go all the way back to like caveman days here, right? For Since you like to talk evolutionary theories like this. Caveman days. So you're about to have sex with your partner in the cave and there's a lion's den around the corner and, you, and you almost got eaten at lunchtime that day already. Mm -hmm. And they've been, they've been, but you're going to have sex anyways. Is there something chemically that's going on in your body stress wise because you you're heightened because of that and that you're having sex and you're less likely to get yeah, pregnant? Chronic stress, uh, lowers testosterone, uh, cortisol goes through the roof. Um, and you, it starts to become, um, break your body down, starts to break you down. And, um, again, that's the evolutionary argument, right? Is if you don't feel, and this is especially true for women. You, you mentioned the danger aspect, uh, where they just, they won't, they don't want to because they have to feel safe. Um, and the body's like this as well. So libido is one of those things. And actually what's funny is the number one, and I, I would love to hear your guys' opinion on, or, or your experience with this from my clients. One of the number one things I would get commented comments on would be that they would notice an improvement in their libido. Mm -hmm. Of course, the people would lose weight and get stronger and feel more fit and all that stuff. But I would also have clients tell me that they felt yeah, a stronger it, it libido. seemed to be those two factors of the libido increase and also the appetite increase. And, and a lot of this was just that a lot of the factors of feeling and, and being healthy, a lot of these things started to really align uh, for them all at the same time. And I think, well, there's a couple of things. You get more confident, obviously, uh, <clears throat> when you get stronger and when you feel like you're improving yourself. So that's got to be, you know, one component to that is now I'm going to portray myself in a kind of a different way, mm. uh, which then is attractive to. A potential mate. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. It kind of speaks to the types of clients that we all train. Like if we were to say what category you train the most of, I've talked on the show that I did a lot of like middle, middle age, high performing, like CEO type, mm -hmm. you know, clients and VPs and stuff. I would actually say like the number one thing that I would see was related more towards like uh, stress, just, uh, just high stress job and and feeling that all the time and not realizing because they think oh because they exercise and they exercise high intensity so they're consistent and maybe they're not overweight or anything uh and so they're coming to me going like this is it's not adding up adam i'm not mm -hmm. way overweight i train five days a week consistently mm -hmm. i you know have a great job i have money so i'm not i'm not poor and broke and worrying where my next meal is going to come from I, I got that a lot. Yeah. yeah. They're getting inundated with stress and they're not sleeping. I mean, I got that all the time. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, so, so there's, there, there's a lot of things that can influence, um, you know, your libido in a negative way. And so there's, there's a lot of ways 
you can look at this. Now, someone might be thinking, what does libido have to do with a fitness and health podcast? Everything. Again, libido, like hunger or like your natural, your body's natural ability to fall asleep and wake up you're the, when, you, when you're thirsty. Like these are all, these things are intricately tied to health. And libido is no different. Um, it's affected by quite a few different things. So let's start at the top. Let's start with diet and how diet can affect libido in a positive or negative way. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is nutrient deficiencies. This is a big one, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one client in particular that comes to the top of my head. I, I used to train this woman who was a vegan for a long time. She'd come to me. She'd been a vegan for, I believe it was 10 years. And we started to do some strength training. And up until that point, all she'd done was cardio um, and then, of course, her diet. Now, she was not overweight. If anything, she was underweight. And she had some interesting symptoms, uh, fatigue, kind of weakness. Um, you know, we got a little deeper. I started working with her and her her doctor. She just, her, her period was kind of on and off. And I noticed when I trained her, I had to be very careful with the resistance training. Like, like moderate intensity was about as hard as I can go. Anything over that, and it's just like fried her body. Mm -hmm. So the doctors started doing uh, deeper and deeper tests on her and found that she had some nutrient deficiencies. She started taking supplements. She got a little better, but not much. Finally, she took the leap and started to include animal uh, sources of uh, you know, protein into her diet and include, especially red meat. And she noticed a marked improvement. By the way, this isn't the solution for everybody who has issues or every vegan, but for her, it was. She started eating some red meat, she started eating some fish, she threw in some eggs into her diet and she was like a brand new person. Now, uh, would you say it's something that was in the meat or just yes. in general low protein? No, it was something that was, she was, uh, there were nutri her nutrient deficiencies were pretty specific. Like iron just, or yes, something like that? Okay. Yes, yes, and it made uh -huh, and it made a huge difference. Okay. And nutrient deficiencies will make you feel terrible, by the way. Like, this is when taking vitamins can make a huge difference for someone, right? Um, in man, zinc, if zinc is a little low, testosterone can get converted to estrogen at higher rates. You could get if you if boron boron is a trace element right boron is low in a man's diet that can cause his sex uh, binding globulin I believe hormone which is a, something that that uh, connects to testosterone making it essentially inactive in the body that can raise that if that if that's too low for example so that, where, where do you find that boron oh, I'm not quite sure the foods you can find that in Doug I know you could supplement up. yeah maybe Doug could look that up for me in, uh, but uh, that's just one just off the top of my head. One thing that popped up, vitamin D, right? If it, a lot of people are lacking in vitamin D. Vitamin D being low in men and in women can cause uh, low, low, low libido. T. Yeah, mm -hmm. and low testosterone in men. Right, right. Uh, magnesium, another very common. What, and I believe both magnesium and and uh, vitamin D are, uh, I believe, north of sixty five percent of people have a deficiency. Is some that people, correct? some studies will say that much. Some studies will say less, a little less. But basically, a, a lot of people. Um, okay, boron, you can find it in avocado, raisins, peaches. Oh, good. I thought grape I was juice. Have to go to some kind of like Beans. nuclear plant or something. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some boron. Yeah. No. So. If you if you have a nutrient deficiency, you're you're going to everything's going to feel much worse. And libido is usually one of the very first things uh, to happen. This is why they say like think of foods that people would consider that are, are widely considered to be aphrodisiacs, right? Like oysters, mm -hmm. right? You've heard that, right? Eat yeah. oysters, and it's a, oysters are high in zinc. So oh, those have is. a lot of zinc. And now, so now is your theory on this with the evolutionary theory is is are women more susceptible to this than men are? So if let's say you have a, a man and a woman, both are nutrient deficient, are they equally mm -hmm. affected, you think, libido-wise of this? Or because women are the ones that are carrying the baby and are are they at higher risk for having deficiencies? That's a good question. Um, it depends on the deficiency. I know the deficiencies tend to be different in men and women. For example, it's not common for a man to have low iron. Far more common for a woman to have low iron, especially if she has a regular period, for example, right? So the nutrient deficiencies can be a little bit differently, uh, different. Uh, magnesium, I said magnesium earlier, that requirement goes up the more stress that you have. So now the only way to know if you have a nutrient deficiency is really to get your blood tested mm -hmm. and to test yourself and see. Um, but if you have a diet that's very restricted, then you may be having a nutrient deficiency. So that's one of the first things I would say with uh, diet is to have a balanced diet. Make sure you have your animal sources of, uh, of meats in there. Those are the most nutrient-dense foods. Organ meats are also very high 
in nutrients and a wide variety of uh, fruits and vegetables. Now, I, in terms of like cholesterol or something like that, like in terms of like how that affects, like it's a, a hormone sensitive tissue, like like we're, we're consuming uh, cholesterol, like how is that going to affect like my, uh, my, my performance? Yeah. So eating cholesterol is, seems to increase strength in some people, muscle in some people. Um, the FDA now says it's no longer a nutrient of concern. Really, it has more to do with your own blood lipid levels. If those are all off, uh, your blood pressure is high, that kind of stuff, then we do see, uh, especially in men, lowering libido and uh, problems with uh, erections. I also think it's important that we elaborate on uh, balanced, quote unquote, diets yes. too, because uh, you, you, you can go wrong both directions, right? For example, like obviously if you're grossly over consuming food and you're eating a lot of you know carbs fats and proteins so you have a balance of That's macronutrients a great question. but you're That's over a consuming point. a lot high body fat percentage uh, you're just as at, almost or just as at risk as somebody who is eating tremendously low because they're trying to lose body fat. So that you have to be careful when you say something like balance, right? Some people think, oh, balanced diet. I'm no, on a diet. I'm following whatever. Yeah, dude, because you take somebody who's like just they're obese because they mm -hmm. overeat and you cut them down. They all of a sudden feel their libido go up. Mm -hmm. On the reverse, you take someone who diets all the time right. and you boost their, their calories up. All of a sudden, they feel a libido boost. Right. Also, carbs, fats, and proteins, especially proteins and fats. Those are essential. I would see this with female clients where they, their fat intake was too low. Yeah. And this I bumped was, their fat. That was very common. The I think first, that's why I was getting it. Oh, yeah. The first five years of training, this was actually one of the most common things. Now that you guys are bringing back memories. I remember that that was still, when I first came in at 20, uh, this is like 20 years ago, uh, the, the whole fat makes you fat was still popular. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was still like the, the prevalent message in the space. And so I think that that was really popular. And even myself, I was the I did the you know low fat or non fat milk and I avoided a lot of high fat stuff. I didn't eat a lot of red meat. If I did eat meat, it was like filet mignon and like leaner cuts mm -hmm. because I was always trying to keep my fat intake. I remember when I first did some diving on like how how much fat like per I should have been eating. I was grossly under eating by like fifty yeah. percent. And also too with a lot of female clients, I noticed that like being in a calorie deficit for just an extended amount of time, like. Uh, it really affected a lot of you know the the libido and and you know like in terms of like it, it, the hormone balance and everything else so like having not having periods anymore and like getting down so low where where they had like hair uh, falling yep. out things like that so well, well of course because what I mean what is the I forget what I've seen I, I want to say it's like thirty five hundred calories like in order and and a serving of liver I think I've heard right in order for someone to get all the nutrients that their body needs through whole foods, like the way they would have to eat. It's more calories than most people burn. It is. It is. Yeah. So it, it, I want to say it was somewhere around 3,500 calories plus a serving of this livers is why every day. This like, is why nutrient-dense foods are so important because they have calories, but they're also chock full of nutrients. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're eating calories without lots of nutrients, and that can pose problems. You could eat the right amount of calories, but your nutrients be too low for your body. This mm -hmm. also this also reminds me of a point that we're we're trying to always present on this show too. Is like uh, we came out really hard early on uh, when when Mind Pump first started, like kind of hating on a lot of supplements. Right, just mm -hmm. it's a waste of money for most people and don't spend money. But where I do see tremendous value in supplementation is when you have a deficiency. Oh yeah, and I think that's that, when it's a miracle. This is where I the see purpose tremendous that. value. And the the beauty of that, by the way, is those are relatively cheap. Like mm -hmm. you, you know, go buy vitamin D or something like that, or K or something it is really really cheap to get. So getting your blood work done, finding out where your levels are at, and instead of running down to your you know performance or GNC or whatever you know supplement store and buying the latest fat burner, muscle builder type of thing, you should first look into all your potential deficiencies that you have, balance that out first before you ever think about spending any money on like a performance supplement. Yes. Um, also, don't go too low in any macronutrient, even a super low carb diet. Now, now here's the caveat. Mm -hmm. If the low carb diet is greatly improving your health, then that's totally fine. So anything that improves your health should improve your libido. But if you're nor if you're okay eating some carbs and you decide you just want to cut them all out because you think it's going to make you lean faster or whatever, going too low in carbs can also, in many ways, uh, negatively affect people's libidos. I've seen this happen in clients as well, where they're just dieting so hard, their calorie their their carbs are so low, and I just have them bump their carbs a little. All of a sudden, libido comes back. You know, you were talking about supplements. Besides supplements that fill nutrient deficiencies, which is number one. 
there are supplements out there, uh, if everything else is okay and good, that can help quite a bit. Like horny goat weed uh, for men actually has been shown to improve erection uh, quality and libido. In women, uh, maca is a supplement that has been shown to help women. So is ginseng. So well, there are some supplements what, out Tung there. Tongue Cat Ali. Tongue Cat Ali is uh, you know another one for men. Tribulus would be another one. Um, so there are some supplements out there that can definitely help with the in the libido department. They, they don't, but they don't hold a candle to you know replacing a nutrient well, and a lot or, of or time, a nutrient that you need. Not to mention, you're also sometimes uh, you're just treating the symptom and not the root cause. You're true, right? right? Mm -hmm. So if you if the reason why you have a a low libido is because you're super stressed out and you got a bunch of shit going on like that, yeah. and then you take those supplements that you just said and it makes you feel a little bit better, it doesn't mean that that was the problem and this is the answer. It just means that temporarily that's making you feel better than yes. what you felt before. It becomes a bit of a band-aid. Yeah, you have to be careful stuff yeah. like that. Here's another one with diet. This is a big one. Eat foods that you can digest easily. Uh, there's Nothing will kill your libido faster than having your gut feel bloated or mm -hmm. have heartburn or gas or constipation or diarrhea. In fact, that's probably one of the most common things that you see where somebody isn't in the mood and why their digestion feels a little off. I feel yeah. bloated. I got heartburn. Those gas noises are not sexy. No, they're <laughs> is not. That have, is that because it has to do with like circulation? Is that why? Is I think it's probably a part partially because it's low inflammatory, right? So you got some inflammation in your body. You just don't feel good. That's what I mean. If you're inflamed like that, I would I imagine that slows down circulation, right? Yeah, and yeah. And also- Not ideal for trying to get an erection. No. Also, um, it, you just you don't feel sexy. You know, yeah. you're, if you're bloated or you're constipated- or you had diarrhea, or you got a bunch of heartburn, yeah. uh, you're just not in the mood. It's funny because I, I've, I've seen this with clients too where we do a, like elimination diet so we could find their, the foods that are bothering their, their digestion poorly. They'll take those foods out and everything is better. Libido too, but everything is better because they don't have that low level inflammation from the foods that bother them. The common offenders for people tend to be gluten, processed foods, Nuts, uh, uh, egg whites, dairy, and dairy. Yeah, those are the most common ones. That you, and if you if so, if you're trying to figure out what's bothering you, start by eliminating those, and then see how you feel. Vegetables can sometimes cause nutrient deficiencies. So I tell people to excuse me, not nutrient deficiencies, but rather uh, gut issues. So I tell people to cook them very well. So raw vegetables can cause bloat. In issues, yeah. cook them really well. Watch what happens, and oftentimes you can, can digest flare up those autoimmune. You know, I just saw the post that our friend uh, Paul Saladino did on the carnivore diet with his. He has a he had a client that had the psori had psoriasis really bad, mm. like worse than I have, and how much like the carnivore diet completely just healed that up. And that's Which an is example of what elimination you, diet, right? It's that what's like the ultimate elimination. Diet. I don't. I, I definitely don't advocate for it forever, long term. Yeah. But if you're eliminating things to see what's bothering you, mm -hmm. that's about the most extreme you can go. All right. just all meat and then slowly start to reintroduce things to find out right. you know what's bothering you. Right. We've mentioned stress a bunch of times. That's got to be one of the biggest uh, problems. You know, the issue with stress, because I keep hearing people say this when it comes to stress, is they'll say, you know, do things that aren't as stressful. Um, and I get that. The problem with that is sometimes the things that are, that you do that are stressful are things that are necessary. Like, mm. well, my job, I have to work. Right. You yeah. say, well, change your job. Well, yeah, that's easy for you to say, but yeah. or like get your kids ready for school. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm a father. Got to do that. Or I'm a mom. Like it's just I have a baby at home. Like I can't. You know, how can I deal with the stress differently? I would say is probably right. a better approach. Sort of reframe your mentality towards a lot of these things. Yeah, one of the best things you could do is, and this is what studies show, is have a spiritual practice. Now, this can look like religion. It could look like meditation. But, and Arthur Brooks says this very well. He says, it's a 40,000 view look at life and meaning and things. So daily... If, you, if you're religious, daily prayer could do this for you, uh, or it just daily examining things and looking things. What's the meaning of this? Why am I doing this? Why am I here? What are the important things? What that does is it takes stressful situations, and it really does reframe them quite a bit. I also think the other problem talking about stress is actually there's a, a big portion of my clients that didn't think they had it. 
right? Because they've adapted to their lifestyle so well. Mm -hmm. They're this high performing CEO, or like I said, VP. And that's, that's been the grind for the last 15 years. That's just life. Yeah. Life is that way. Yeah. Or they are always rushing to get their kids ready because they got four of them and they're doing it by themselves. And that's just my life. Mm -hmm. I don't consider that stress. They've learned to reframe it as not a negative thing, but it's still this low level of stress that they're constantly taking on. Yeah. And that person has to know that they're, their diet and training needs to be able to mirror their lifestyle and support it instead of piling on more stress because exercise is also a stress. Oh, yeah. well, this is why we like talking about diet, nutrition, and exercise is because we're now bringing that focus on yourself. Like You need to be able to pour from a full cup and to be able to kind of like take yourself out of, like I have to do all these things for all these other people and then I have to do this over here for work and you know really like taking that time out to uh, be present and, and, and really kind of assess and have have that that talk like what can I do better to improve like how can I you know be more present how can I calm down and, and just focus on breathing or doing something very specifically for yourself uh, is is, a, is an important factor well, well yeah I mean if you're stressed out because work is hard and you have kids and you can't change those things and on top of it your body's not fit you're unhealthy and you don't get good sleep well you're just you're just way less resilient you're just not gonna be able to handle those things as well so mm -hmm. you know basically what you're talking about is building your body's strength and resilience to deal with the stuff that's going to happen no matter what. But I can't stress the spiritual practice enough because it does change the way you view things. I'll give you an example. So as a, as a dad, when, when I, my first kids, uh, I was in my twenties and it's a, it's a big change. It, life is not about me anymore. Now I was, it was, it was a big learning curve. And initially you think to yourself, I want my old life, but I also want my kids. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Life is different now. And it took me a second to accept it. And when I did, it wasn't stressful. But when I didn't accept it, and I'm like, but I want to go out and hang out. I want to leave the house whenever I want. I, I don't want to have to drop them off. I, you know, now I got to wake up earlier just to drop them off. Like if you don't accept it and you don't have that, that practice, boy, can it be real stressful. But then you have this spiritual practice where you look at things and you see the meaning in things. Then it's like, oh yeah, this is something that's cool. I want to do this. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. It's still hard. It's just not as stressful. By the way, hard doesn't mean stressful necessarily, right? Oh, well, there's low level stress all yes. day long. That's right. what I'm saying. I think there's a lot of people that don't think they're 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 stressed out like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that you just get used to it and you just assume that this is life. And so I don't realize that I'm taking on all this. And then again, and what I what I have found in my experience that same type of client that has a lot of that also gravitates to the diets and the exercise that's not ideal for them. They go for the extreme mm -hmm. stuff. Right. They like that intensity. And they, and they and we talk about this, before, we've talked about this a long time ago, the, the cortisol junkie. Yeah. Right. They get that they, that adrenaline rush and they and they need something so intense that that crushes them to get that rush or that high again. And so they gravitate to it, not realizing that it's the complete opposite way of training that that person actually needs. Yeah, to put it more, to put it differently, right? This person is, they're, they're always flooded with stress chemicals and hormones. Their body has literally become desensitized to those things. So they feel tired, sluggish. And so in order for them to feel normal, they have to squeeze out more stress chemicals and stress hormones. And so what do they do? Super intense workout. And for an hour or two afterwards, they feel normal again mm -hmm. until they crash. They don't just feel normal. They feel great. That was one of the hardest things as a trainer that I had to overcome. Like I didn't understand this on this level when I was first training. And you get a client and be like, I don't care what you say, Adam. I take that class and I just I feel great afterwards. Right. Because they that that's the that's the most they get flooded ever because like you said they become so desensitized to it that they have to do a class like that to get that rush and that feel again and trying to take that away from somebody is really difficult but they have to realize it's not what's ideal yeah, for them. Yeah, here's one that's more modern uh, times is uh, turning off electronics. Uh, uh, yeah, you know it's funny I, I I never really considered this until Jessica pointed this out when I first started uh, dating her and she said you know. We don't have a lot of time where we do nothing. And I'm like, what do you mean? We, do, we have nothing time all the time. So no, no, no. What I mean is back in the day, if you're waiting in line, for example, at the store, you, didn't, you weren't stimulating yourself with social media and reading. You were just standing. Mm -hmm. If you were in traffic, you might have music on, but you're just sitting. Or when you're at home, sometimes you got nothing to do. You're just sitting there in the quiet. And that definitely allows the body to kind of repair and recover a little bit. Turning off electronics can make a big difference. And what's funny now is we're so used to constantly being distracted. Mm -hmm. Turning off electronics can feel like, 
I don't know yeah, what to well, do. What do I do? Yeah, what do I do? But that's a big one. This is why sometimes going in nature, I think, makes a big difference because you turn everything off. What if it also allows you to be introspective that you're talking about? You talk about your spiritual right. practice. You open the door for whether you want to do a spiritual practice or just practice being coming more self-aware. Yep. Mm-hmm. You need to create that space for yourself to allow yourself to even go there and do that if it's going to be recuperative for you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And what goes hand in hand with the electronics is just what kind of content you're consuming constantly and what you're getting inundated right. with. And, you know, you really have to kind of assess that. Like, is is what I'm looking at constantly benefiting me? And and a lot of times, like, I, I know, like, especially these days with everything going on, everybody wants to keep paying attention, be informed. And that, you know, involves a lot of taking in the news and, you know, the latest and greatest. Unfortunately, it's all, you know, negative doom and gloom all of these it days. Is. All of it's negative doom. You know, other stresses on our body are environmental toxins. Uh, there's a new book that just came out that talked about, in fact, I've talked about this on the podcast several times, how sperm counts are dropping, testosterone levels are dropping, fertility is decreasing in women. And a lot of scientists think it's due to a lot of the toxins that we're exposed to in plastics, cosmetics, our cooking utensils, you know, nonstick pans, that kind of stuff. This can actually believe, and they, they now have studies that show some pretty scary stuff. They did some studies on mice, in fact, where they exposed them to uh, phthalates and the male mice grew with smaller penises, testicles that wouldn't descend, and essentially the body stopped forming into male. And, and this was in utero. They find these plastics in women's, uh, in pregnant women's blood, in their breast milk. This this stuff is everywhere. So literally fi- buying products from places that minimize or eliminate some of these things can make a big difference. It's cumulative, and it's usually the places that we t- t- tend to find them are. In the containers that we hold things, so plastic containers, whether it be water or food containers or whatever, um, and cosmetics, the things that we rub on our skin, that we you know put under our arms, the perfumes that we put on, um, those those uh, have a pretty big impact. Was this the the scientist that Joe Rogan just had? That, yes. Okay, I was gonna say we've been getting tagged all day today. Yep. yep. I don't know if you guys saw that or not. I, I know did. He, he just posted. I haven't. Did he? I know you listen normally. Yeah. Uh huh. Did you listen? Yeah, to it? I started to listen to. It. It's great. It's it, it's confirming everything we brought up from that study that was alarming, really alarming. I was just because that's what everyone's tagging us, going like the mind pump's been saying this for a while. So I was wondering what what is she? Is that where a lot of the information that you you that's where. All of yes, that's where all. Came oh from. wow! Okay. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. wow! She okay. did all that research. They, oh. Yeah, they did, and they they did research on people too, and they actually found these strong connections. So you can minimize your exposure by buying products that go on your skin or that you cook with or you store things in that don't contain these chemicals or that aren't plastic at all. Like uh, you could switch all your containers to glass, the things that you store your water in to glass. You can even use uh, stainless steel, um, and then of course cosmetics. You could get your products from places. Uh, that don't sell. You, you know, know the other one that was really bad that I didn't think it would be that bad is uh, receipts. The, yep, that mm-hmm. waxy. Yeah, film, that, you know how high that is. In it's some really of high. That's uh-huh. what I thought was really interesting. I'm mm-hmm. always like, when they ask for my, rece- no, 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 I don't want to know. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I, go, I do Email that too. It to me. I did that the other day. I was just picking up a drink yeah. from the gas yeah. station. Do you want your receipt? She said, Nah, I don't want the receipt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to yeah. be having sex for yeah. ten more years. Give me that micro penis. Let's talk about let's talk about mental health now, right? Well, that's a perfect transition from talking about stress because a lot of the things that you guys are talking about yes. right now, right, with you know spiritual practice and getting outside and turning off your electronics, a lot of that feeds into mental health. Yes. Now, here's a big one with mental health. And this one is a relatively new phenomenon that we're seeing, uh, that we've seen now in the past, I guess, decade in particular, uh, the use of pornography. Pornography's existed uh, as long as we've been able to draw on walls. I mean, I, I know we know this. We've seen some of these old, you know, paintings and stuff, and there's definitely evidence <laughs> that we would draw pictures of naked people and yeah. stuff like. So it's been around for a long time. The difference is n- these days, and, and for a while now, it's been easily accessible, and the variety of pornography, the novelty of it, which there's a, there's a the novelty aspect is huge, right? If you look at a pornographic image, it has an effect on your brain, and after a while, it starts to lose that effect. And if you look at another one that's different, you start to spark that same effect. Well, we have so much novelty, so much variety and ease of access that we're actually desensitizing our brains to sexual stimuli. And they're finding that it's causing uh, like erectile dysfunction in men, and it's causing sex dysfunction in women as well. So pornography is one of the big ones. Not watching it, not using it, oftentimes the side effect of that is a ramped up 
libido. Then this doesn't have to do with masturbation, by the way. You could still masturbate, just not use pornography, and you still see this ramp up of libido. Were they able to trace it back? Because I know they started to really see you know it, it go younger and younger to, to where it was like almost in the teenage boys that were you know having this this problem yes. of erectile dysfunction, and and you wonder if it's because of all of the exposure and accessibility to to porn. Oh, it makes it it makes a huge difference. There's actually voluntarily uh, young men are are is chewing uh, pornography. They have like groups online where the where the guys say, "Oh yeah, isn't that where November? Isn't yeah. that where No Fap came from? That's where yeah. it came from, right? No, it, not November. And it, is that the? Re- it started because of that, yep. is it because of the, the 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 issues that were arising. I mean, to me, that was that's been the most alarming and interesting things that I've noticed just in our business in the last ten years. That is completely different. If I compared like our first ten years as trainers to the last ten, like as far as the clients, the questions, the stuff that I get. Uh, since Mind Pump, so six years we've been doing this, uh, I never, before that, I never once had a 24-year-old guy come up to me and say, I have- This is an issue. Yeah, I have low testosterone or ED. I've ne- never, yeah. not one time did that ever happen in my career. That I get that, that's a common actual DM now. Because yeah. we openly discuss and talk about that on here- I get a lot of a lot of these guys that that tell me that this is something that they they either went to the, the get their blood work done, came back, and they got like two hundred or yeah. lower levels, or they have ED issues. Like unbelievable that you're seeing that at such a young age. Yep, yep. Yeah. Here's another one: is to have good close relationships with the people around you, especially with your partner. That makes such a big difference when it comes to mental health. I mean. We, and we really tested that this last year with mm-hmm. our lockdowns mm-hmm. and the way we isolated ourselves. The social, uh, you know, being social is such an integral part of human health. I mean, it's considered a, a cruel and unusual punishment by the Geneva Convention to take a prisoner of war and to isolate them from all people for too long. I mean, this is, these are war rules, right, that we all agreed upon. This is how important it is to have relationships and connections to the people around you. And if you have none or they're they're shallow or you're not allowing yourself to have some, oh. maybe you're too afraid of getting your feelings hurt or whatever, you're actually causing yourself some mental anguish. We're social creatures. I mean, that's the way that we're wired. And to uh, you, you know, try and remove us from that experience, you know, we feel that, and our body responds according to that. So, you know, and then I remember that one study you brought up about uh, uh, I forget about the relationships and, and what that you know, in terms of like the blue zones, is that being um, you know a, a massive factor? Oh, it was, it was as bad for you as smoking. I think it was like a pack of that's cigarettes it. a day, yes. which uh-huh. is uh, incredible. Um, now, now, do you guys think? that uh you know connecting on zoom and facebook and instagram and being socially connected like that does this not count towards our 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 our, you know social interaction i talked to arthur brooks about this and he said that it counts a little bit now you know social media not the same debating and talking to some random stranger online over a post or whatever no connecting with some friends that you haven't talked to for a while family right family yeah he says it counts a little but the way our bodies and brains are wired, you need to be in person. It makes such a tremendous difference that 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 three D image of the person, all the details of how we're interacting, mm-hmm. the fact that I can't just hang up and turn off body a, language, body language, all these things make a huge difference. Yeah, I would think that like the the social cueing from like body language and and gestures and and your and touch, yeah, neuro neuro touch, all those things. I would think. I mean, that just makes you a more socially aware person. Where you when you're doing that on a screen, you don't get that right. No, yeah. and it's what is that two D versus three D, right? You yes. get the, you can't you you don't get all of those social cues, which right. is what makes you don't perceive it the same way at all. Uh, now, my interpretation of this is is and where where I think I've seen examples of this, and you guys can agree or disagree with this. But we've had the opportunity to obviously interview hundreds of people now that we've been doing this for so many years now, uh, and, and within those hundreds of people, we've met quite a few people that are you know would be quote unquote you know Insta famous or YouTube famous with millions of people paying attention to them. And I would say more often than not, these super famous social media people um, are socially awkward when mm-hmm. we meet them. They don't make good eyes. They're de- depressed. Yeah. N- n- they, and they have a whole different character. Because they've substituted real connection for fake connection. Yeah. Right they, 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 they are acting and putting on a show, and they seem very charismatic and sociable and fun on Instagram or on YouTube. And then in person, 
awkward and shy and nervous all of a sudden. Really, yeah. really interesting to me. It is, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it, you know, it's funny when my kids finally went back to school. I remember my daughter; she's fifth grade, being nervous to go back to school and uh, almost awkward about it because it's a skill. It's any, it's like any skill. I mean, right. imagine if you live in a cave by yourself for fifteen years; you're going to be weird when you come out. You know what I mean? You're not going to be the same. <laughs> yeah. So it's all very important. You know, you mentioned touch. That is. That has been proven to be integral to our health. In fact, the Soviets did a yes. terrible study. Yeah, with babies. I remember this. Terrible study. This was a real study that they did where they had orphans, and they divided the orphans into two groups. Right, they were like twins or triplets, right? Isn't that what it was? I don't remember if they were twins or triplets, but I do know that this had to do with orphans. And what they did is they took one half, and the nurses or the, the, the caretakers would go in, feed them, and that's it. So all they would do is go in, feed them with the bottle, and walk out. The other group got fed, but also got held and cuddled, and they make eye contact with them. And the study was to see, does it make a difference in health? Tremendous difference. The, mm -hmm. the babies that were not held and cuddled and make eye contact with uh, developed mental and physical issues, uh, motor control issues, mm -hmm. mental issues, uh, mental disabilities. Be all because of the lack of touch. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important thing. It's funny, when I used to have my, my wellness studio, I had a massage therapist in there. And I remember sometimes I'd get the occasional client that I could tell would val would benefit from, you know, these are these are people that were either high performing, very but they're very like closed, very closed off. And I remember I'd think to myself like, boy, this person could really use massage. Not the massage aspect, that's nice, but just somebody touching them. There was one guy in particular, I won't mm -hmm, say his name, mm -hmm. But he was kind of like that, very uh, abrasive, right, rigid, standoffish. Like, hey. Yeah, everything was at arm's length with this guy. And I remember thinking like, oh, he'll totally change if I can get him. In. And so that's what I did. I offered him a free massage. I eventually convinced him. He's like, I don't like people touching me. I'm like, and I can, the way I convinced him was, you need to do this for muscle function. It'll help you build muscle. Reality, right. I'm like, you need someone to freaking rub some oil on you. <laughs> he went yeah. in the back and he came out and after, and that was it, man. He would get massages weekly and he opened up and became a different person. It's a very important part yeah, of health. There's this interesting transfer of energy or something in, in, involving that. I have had the same experience with some clients that were very standoffish. Like that was the big hesitancy towards uh, massage was, I just don't like other, you know, strangers or people touching me or, you know, they're creating mm -hmm. this complete barrier and wall around them physically and to be able to to break some of the, that wall down was was a huge transformation that they went through. Yeah, now let's talk about exercise, right? So this is what we deal with the most. Exercise can either help or hurt your libido. Uh, so someone listening might be like, what do you mean hurt? How's it going to hurt my libido? Well, if you do it wrong or you do too much. Well, like I alluded to. Yeah, like or like we yeah, exactly what you said earlier where if it's too much of a stress on your body, you're not getting good sleep, you're really stressed out and on top of it you do high intensity interval training or long distance running, uh, too much of a stress on the body. Now your libido, and I've seen this by the way, one of the number one signs of overtraining is a loss of libido. So if you're wondering, am I working out too much? Is your libido down? If it is- Check in the morning. Yeah, yeah. you just, <laughs> your libido might be, might be low. So proper exercise will always foster a healthy libido. Now the best form of exercise to do this is, uh, in, in, in my opinion, strength training. Resistance training done properly is a pro-tissue form of exercise, right? So pro-tissue, meaning the direct result of resistance training, proper resistance training, is to send the adaptation to the body to build muscle. So it's a pro-anabolic form of exercise. In order for that to happen, hormones need to balance out. So what we find in men is reliably proper strength training raises testosterone. No other form of exercise will do this in men on a, on a reliable basis. In women, it'll balance out progesterone and estrogen, sometimes raise their testosterone a little bit as well. Yes, women have testosterone, and many times they benefit from having it be a little higher as well. Strength training will do this, and it's mainly because the main adaptation that it's asking the body to do is pro-tissue. Pro other forms of exercise are not like this, right? Excessive cardiovascular activity or a lot of cardio is not pro-tissue, tends to be anti-tissue. In order to increase your stamina, your endurance, you're probably going to lose a little bit of muscle. Um, and of course, both of them will, uh, all forms of exercise done properly might help you burn body fat. But nonetheless, it's not a pro-tissue form of exercise. This is one of those situations where I say the, the opposite tends to be the rule, right? The, the people that need to get strength training, exercise more in, in their life are the ones most likely to gravitate to not exercising at all, not training, and getting them involved in, in moving and exercise is going to do tremendous things for their libido. 
the people that love to exercise and train hard and push themselves all the time are the ones that normally need to scale back on this. So knowing who you are, if you have a low libido and then asking yourself, which one of those people are you? Are you somebody who has a low libido and you already like to train and stuff? More than likely, you need to change the way you're training and actually be more recuperative. If you're somebody who has a low libido and you never train, you need to move your ass. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one, right? Insulin sensitivity. So insulin resistance is directly connected to in men low testosterone but low libido in both men and women one of the most effective things you could do to improve your insulin sensitivity is build muscle muscle is a wonderful uh protecting it's, it's a protective tissue it is insulin sensitive it, it improves or increases your body's ability to store glycogen or store sugar um, so more muscle tends to equal better insulin sensitivity. So again, another case for strength training um, being one of the best forms of exercise uh, You know, in, in terms of that. Um, mm -hmm. So again, balances out the hormones, improves insulin sensitivity, pro tissue. Here's another one. If you're in pain because of mobility, nowadays most pain is a result of not moving enough and having poor mobility or just being weak in general, right? Proper strength training improves mobility, reduces pain. So if you have chronic hip pain, chronic knee pain, chronic back pain, that's going to kill your libido. You don't right. want to feel you don't feel like doing anything when you're hurting. Well, correctional you exercise the positions too. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Correctional exercise applied properly involves a form of strength training, and that also, of course, takes away the pain, makes you feel better, and that can improve your uh, libido. Look, if you like Mind Pump's content, you got to go head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We've got great guides on fat burning, muscle building. I have a testosterone boosting guide. I even have guides for personal trainers. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. I notice when I eat beef, I feel energized. You know, Maybe you're, you're lacking some nutrients or whatever. Maybe you're lacking iron. So you eat beef and you feel energized. Maybe when you eat vegetables, your digestion improves. And you notice this. And over time, you start to want those foods. This is how you start to mold and shape your behavior in a way that allows you to find success 